Hi, thanks for joining me. And uh, I'm here to talk about Miranda Chase number one drone and five questions that are insider factoids and questions from readers and so on. Warning, there are spoilers. So let's jump in. The technology. The drone uh, doesn't exist yet, but it wouldn't surprise me if it did. The technology is that close. And what I actually based the physical aircraft on is the uh, Gulfstream, who makes the small business jets, and Sukhoi, which is known for its Russian fighter jets. After the Cold War, before the new Cold War, uh, were working together to build a supersonic passenger jet that would work better than the Concorde did and uh, the failed SST and all of that, and the Tupolev, the Russian one that really didn't fly at all. Uh, and they came, they got far enough that they were showing models at air shows and then the whole thing fell apart. Gulfstream is pretty sure they're still pursuing it. And we'll see variations of that coming out with the uh, boomless, the no sonic boom or very low sonic boom designs that are coming out of NASA right now. Anyway, I, that was my basis, was a, a supersonic, highly efficient, super cruise capable aircraft. But instead of making a passenger craft, I looked at the military and said, gee, they're, they're pulling the pilots down to the ground more and more often. So let's do that. One of the things that we see in control of aircraft is they've done a lot of testing with based on eye movement and vocal commands, um, not just, you know, grabbing the controls and ripping them around. And there have been, Elon Musk right now is working on basically squids. It's a term that's been kicked around since forever, as far as I know. Uh, probably came out of science fiction, but of direct attachment to the brain. And we see it in the Matrix. We see it uh, in a lot of places. It's not that impossible to do. So it's something that could be done probably now. Maybe not accurately enough to control this drone the way I have it controlled. But the first couple books of Miranda Chase, before, as I was trying to figure out what the shape of this series was and what the feel of this series was, was I wanted to push that technologic edge a bit. And I, this is the book I pushed it the most in. And it was kind of like, okay, that's, that's sort of my outer bound. That's where I like this series to sit. And then, uh, we'll see in Thunderbolt and the ones after that, that I dialed that back a little bit and I found finally where it's most comfortable from the feel I want from this series. But this technology that I talk about isn't impossible by any means. It truly would not surprise me if it's out there now. But let's get into the more interesting stuff, the villains. Um, I can't write villains to save my life or I never could. I'm, people accuse me of being too nice. My, it's, I want people to be happy and cheerful and all those good positive things. So to write a, a true villain, I think the closest I came were a couple of the Night Stalkers books where the villain was actually driven by an inner emotion, by a passion, uh, for vengeance um, to right a past wrong because they had been wronged and they made them very empathetic villains. And only once or twice in my life have I written a true villain. Well, Zhang Ru, he was my true villain. And he's just in it for himself. And he doesn't care who he runs over, who he uses, who he manipulates. Who, what lies he tells, he's just purely in it for him. And he's not psychotic. He's not, you know, a serial killer who's broken with 
morals of society and is taking vengeance upon society. He's just purely in it for him. And then in contrast, I set up Clarissa Reese to become the head of the CIA, and eventually, she isn't yet, um, but she's completely in it for her, but she's got a moral code. And the difference is Zhang Ru doesn't. So her moral code is she's there to protect the country, and she's convinced that she's the best person to do it and the only person to do it. And everybody else is stupid because they don't understand that. So they both have immense egos. But I wanted to write a two. I wanted to write a good villain. So <laughs> forcing myself, I wrote a villain without a moral code and a villain with a moral code. And they shaped much more of the series than I expected. So I had so much fun with these two characters. I still do. Well, spoiler, Zhang Ru, he lasted for a while. Clarissa, she's still in there fighting the fight. I want to talk about team building because I purposely started Miranda off with no team. They One retired, one uh, went on maternity leave, leaving Miranda out in the wind without a support system, which is a high strain on an autistic. So I wanted, I purposely undercut Miranda to increase the, the attention on her. But I also wanted us to see that wonderful moment of how a team comes together and how they, they build and how they become part of a team. And the ones like Holly has no interest in being part of a team, yet she's been trained for it so much of her life. Mike never wants anything to do with a team. He's a loner. Jeremy can't wait to be on a team. So it's a, it was, you know, the contrast of their three different personalities and how they would or wouldn't fit into a team was really what I was playing with. One of the interesting evolutions in fiction is early on, fiction was mostly about the lone wolf. It was about the one person going out and you know, braving the jungle or just, you know, Tarzan and uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. And, it, you know, they're, they're out there on their own with no support system. And then we get the team of two. We start getting um, Humphrey Bogart was lo another lone wolf. We start getting the, the teams of two. We start getting the partnerships. We start getting the Laurel and Hardy. We start getting uh, all those it's like they built, and then we get up to three, and things started getting a little odd and unstable. And then we get to five, and that really came in with Doc Savage and that era, and it's the the core leader, the sidekick, the muscle, the brains. It's the and it, there are lots of articles and references about the five man band. And there's a five and a seven and the ensemble. And the odd thing is they skipped four. Almost everybody skipped four. And I gave that a lot of thought in as I was designing this team and building this team. And the reason they, they skip it is it's, a, it's kind of inherently unstable. You end up with two against two so often. And... Um, then there's no resolution. And do you have, if you have a strong leader, then the other three are kind of in tow. And so I purposely built a four man band of Miranda, Holly, Mike, and Jeremy with the idea that there would be a fifth person who would join them for each book to kind of stabilize the team. Well, that didn't happen. They actually have their own instability and their own integration as a group of four that I really enjoyed. And one of the problems in the later books that I'll talk about in more detail is the, it grew. It grew to five when Andy showed up. It grew to six when Taz showed up. And so it was getting so complex to write and keep those dynamics. That's why Jeremy and Taz eventually left to form their own team.
and right now they're a band of two, and I'm sure as the series progresses, that will expand. But the the four-man band of this story uh, really, for me, became a comfortable place, that inherent instability of what happens if one person is in a bad mood. It, it just blasts things apart. Or Miranda has a collapse. Or So that's what's going on if, at the next level down, past the, you know, the happy story, um, is I've got this inherently unstable team that I'm playing with in this book and all the future books. Now, the, the games that I had fun with was I wish farther from the headlines than it is. And I became fascinated with geopolitics because of a writer named Peter Zihan. Uh, he wrote The Accidental Superpower and has since written several other books. Very high-end geopolitical consultant. He's the one who company corporations and governments listen to. He's one of the ones when they're talking about the dynamics of what this country's trying to do and that country's trying to do and what kind of a mess that makes. And so I wanted to delve into two of the most important, and eventually I'll go to the third, two of the most important um, secret groups that are going on. And one is the Chinese Military Commission, which Zhang Ru is trying to become a part of in this book. They control pretty much the country along, and the president is the leader of, of the CMC. And uh, so I wanted to look at the manipulations that are going on behind the scenes there. And I also, the, it's again that the moral code and not moral code is looking at what goes on in the situation room. There's a different, ha there's kind of the same dynamic going on there, but it's, you know, for the good, except Clarissa's in there adding her weird spiky twist and her weird curves and the conflicts that go on. And I wanted to look at, these are the people shaping our world in both places. These are the people shaping the world that the rest of us live in. And I wanted to sort of expose that they're just people. You know, they're, they have their own issues and their own conflicts and their own can't stand this person and trying to help that person. And, oh, we're good buddies. So I'm, you know, the president and the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs are going to work together. But the head of the NRO, the head of the CIA, they're just... The fact that this is how our world works, I think, is a little horrifying. <laughs> but I wanted us to think about that and think about the, one of the purposes in all my writing, as I've mentioned elsewhere, is I want to find that hope that by understanding what's going on around us, we might choose to have some effect, to get involved in some way. The way I get involved is writing about it, researching it and writing about it. But I love watching the games that I was able to set up between these different groups and, you know, the Chinese faction, the Russia faction and the American faction and how they're each functioning dysfunctionally. <laughs> so anyway, that's at the core of many of the books and very definitely in this one. And that that's the geopolitics that I alluded to in the prior slide. Um, it's the wider view. It's bringing it out so that we know about it, so we can talk about it. I want, I so, I go back to uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, which was about World War One and the trenches and the life of the soldiers in the trenches during World War One, And there's, a night, there was a Christmas night where 
all the fighting stopped. And they actually came up out of the trenches, the soldiers, the people themselves, and exchanged Christmas gifts. And they didn't have much. You know, he, they traded sausage for bread kind of things. But they... They sort of, they were just people together for that one night. And the next morning, they were back in the trenches and trying to kill each other. Um, I, I want to bring the, the wider view of the, to light so that we can think about it, so we can talk about it, so we can have discussions about it. And the people are good. The people down in those trenches came up. Those were good people. But they were trapped in this structure, this geopolitical Germany versus the world structure that was going on in that war and World War II and so on. How do we get back to being the good people and connecting to that rather than the mess that's going on and being perpetrated from up above? Again, that's one of the things I wanted to expose in Drone. I wanted to go, hey, look, there's all this secret military stuff and all this manipulating and moving, and we'd probably get along fine with all the people if we met them. But that's that's part of the, the story of Drone and part of the story of Miranda is how do we build these teams, starting with Miranda's little four-person team, and expand it and expand it and affect those around us so that we keep growing into a better place. That's the story behind the story behind the story, so to speak, in Drone. Thanks for listening. Uh, you can visit my website at mlbuckman.com. There's all kinds of fun stuff there, recipes from the books and so on, including a link to this video. So uh, thank you very much. and. See you on the next one.